Israel and Iran, an update in an attempt to predict if anything that is on the Middle East agenda can be predicted at all. Stoltenberg leaves Mark Rutte takes the chair. What Ukraine and the world should expect of that change. And a cherry on a top for your interview with a former officer of the British Army who served in a nuclear unit, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Glenn Grant. Good afternoon. These topics in more detail in a weekly episode with me, Henry Keane, and UATV English, doing our best to bring the hard truth in easy terms for you out there, for the whole free world directly from Ukraine. Call it whatever you like. Not really. Israel leaves on high alert every day since the state has been created. So Israelis don't care what you are going to call it, a conflict or a war. Neither do Iranian terrorists. If you don't like the term Iranian terrorists, well, then most likely you're one of them. Iran launched around 180 missiles towards Israel, the Israeli military confirms. That would make it an even larger attack than April's barrage, which saw about 110 ballistic missiles and 30 cruise missiles fired at Israel. Footage carried by Israeli TV appeared to show some missiles flying over the Tel Aviv area shortly before 9.45 local time. Israeli military officials said the attacks appeared to be over by now and there was no more threat from Iran for now, but it is still unclear how much damage was caused. Most missiles were shot down by Israeli aerial defense systems and Israeli security officials said, while a BBC correspondent in Jerusalem said some military bases may have been hit and that restaurants and schools were hit just as well. The Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has warned Iran of consequences after the attack. Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, IRGC, says, well, of course, that 90% of projectiles had hit their targets, saying hypersonic missiles had been used for this first time. Well, if we dare to believe these guys are saying truth every, like, second time they open their mouth, well, Israel should have been already off of the face of the earth long ago. Still, Israel is there and stands tall and retaliates to terrorists by killing one of the top commanders and leaders of Iran-backed militias in the region and Hezbollah chief Hassan Nasrallah and IRGC commander Abbas Nilforashan in the Lebanese capital of Beirut. And more to come for sure as war in onwards. Israel has a sophisticated system of air defense, the best known of which is the Iron Dome, of course. It is designed to intercept short-range missiles of the sword fired by Hamas and Hezbollah. While it was used to defend against some elements of Iran's last attack in April, other elements of the country's layered defense systems probably did the bulk of the work on Tuesday. I'm talking about David Sling. David Sling is a joint U.S.-Israeli manufactured system that is used to intercept medium to long-range rockets as well as ballistic and cruise missiles. And when it comes to long-range ballistic missiles, which fly outside the Earth atmosphere, Israel has the Arrow 2 and Arrow 3 interceptors. So what happens next? In easy terms, nothing new. Netanyahu said Iran had made a big mistake and will pay for it. We have plans and we will operate at the place and time we decide, said Israel Defense Forces spokesperson Daniel Hagari. Iran's IRGC said Tehran's response will be more crushing and ruinous if Israel retaliated. Also worth mentioning, Israel banned Antonio Gutierrez from visiting the country, announcing it persona non grata after Gutierrez not called a spade a spade in his speech and not condemned an Iranian terroristic attack. Well, if we look decades back in time of this war, we clearly see one thing. Every year, no matter what, Israel grows stronger. And Islamic terrorism only grows bigger. I guess the crucial difference between these tendencies can give you some idea of what happens when this war or conflict, call it all you want, will get to a final stage of a decisive battle. The former Prime Minister of the Netherlands also said NATO needs to plug capability gaps as he took the reins as Secretary General from Norway's Jens Stoltenberg.
It is a great honour to be here, Ruta told members of the Alliance North Atlantic Council. I thank all of you, your nations, for trusting me with the responsibility. The Alliance must step up our support for Ukraine and bring it even closer to NATO. He added after leaders of the Defence Pact said the country's path to membership was irreversible. A strong transatlantic bond is the foundation of our alliance and I can assure you I will do my utmost to ensure that it will stay rock solid. Rutter told reporters earlier, pledging to work together with whoever wins the US elections in November. NATO is now bigger, it is stronger, it is more united than ever, Rutter said, telling his predecessor it was a great honour to follow you as Secretary General to fill your big shoes. Supporting Ukraine is the right thing to do. And it is also an investment in our own security. Because an independent and democratic Ukraine is vital for peace and stability in Europe. And the cost of supporting Ukraine is far, far lower than the cost we would face if we allow Putin to get his way. We in Ukraine can't agree more. And in easy terms, in regards of us in Ukraine, it is a win-win situation of sorts. Both Stoltenberg and Rutte understand the necessity to help Ukraine win. As it craving to win back what it already belongs to it, by the rule of international law, nothing more and nothing less, but a core human rights, freedom of choice and inviolability of borders that should not be taken by a Russian brutal dictatorial criminal force that is trying to get away with it. Lieutenant Colonel Glenn Grant, former British Army officer with 37 years of military experience. Good afternoon, Mr. Grant, sir. Hello. Some of your experience was gained in a nuclear warfare regiment. Am I right? Was it a tactical or strategic? It was a tactical regiment. I was, uh, I was a launcher section commander for a Lance nuclear missile. So we all know, yeah, that most likely Putin won't go nuclear. I know you explained it many times. It's very unlikely in our studio just as well. So my question now is if Putin never watches our interviews and goes nuclear, even tactically, do you sincerely believe that this version of Western authority is capable of taking, let's call it a decisive action and answering Putin properly? Uh, let's let's just look at the nuclear bit first. Yes, because I mean, if he does go nuclear, let, let, you could say it's end game um, for him as much as anything. Um, because uh, I mean, there are two things. First, first of all, there's there's very little military advantage uh, in uh, in this in firing nuclear. Um, uh, it's it, at the tactical level for the simple reason that it makes a complete and utter mess. Um, and then the wind blows, and you get half of it back. It's also not as um, it's not as uh, as powerful as many people think. Um, there's actually there's more uh, there's more explosive power in the engine uh, and the, the fuel, sorry, than there is actually in the nuclear warhead in most tactical nuclear weapons. Um, but okay, so he does it. He causes a mess. Um, if the wind blows the right way, then it blows towards uh, the west. If the wind blows the wrong way, then it turns around and it blows back into Russia. Um, but then what's he going to do with the area that he's actually blown up? It, it, there's no military advantage. It's only political. So we're talking now, is the west actually going to do something? And the, the answer has got to be yes, because for the simple reason that if Putin is allowed to fire a nuclear weapon, uh, then it means anybody else can fire a nuclear weapon, uh, and and that will be uh, that's 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 the end of the the world order as we know it. Um, so you've got to assume that they they would do something. Now, at that point, um, I think we can understand that America has got enough conventional firepower to not have to go nuclear itself. Um, in, it's got so many aircraft that, that can fire conventional weapons accurately um, that, 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 that people have very, very little concept of actually how strong the US is if it wants to fight. And then when you add uh, all, the, all, all the aircraft that are available in, in Finland, Sweden, uh, UK, Germany, you suddenly come up with absolutely huge numbers that dwarf anything that Russia can, can put into the air. 
And we already know that the Russian air defense is pretty weak uh, because the drones are going all the way to, to wherever they want to go from Ukraine. So you come back to the political bit. The answer is yes, the West would have to do something. Would everybody join in? No. I think there are some countries that are so pathetically weak at the moment right. uh, that they might try and sit it out. But in the main, the, the key players would play. So to sit it out, to sit out a nuclear war as the as the way out of I don't know. It's it's it sounds just funny, but all right, you know. Let me make a statement. Let's let's put that aside. Nuclear thing is aside. Absolutely astonishing explanation. Thank you so very much, Mr. Grant. Now to conventional things. I'll make a statement, and you please agree or disagree with it, please. So long-range weapons, firing restrictions for Ukraine ad nausea can be lifted silently. Like, the West can say, yes, but, you know, no. Don't show it. Is that possible? Maybe it already yes. happened. Mm. <clears throat> well, I think that they would do it anyway. If they give a, 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 well, a lifting yeah. of restrictions, right. you won't know. You won't know until the first rounds go down on the ground. Exactly my point. Uh, or Russia, let's say Russia won't know until the first <laughs> rounds go down on the ground. But there's still this this great reluctance to do this because of, you know, this fear, this fear that Putin will do nuclear or he'll he'll escalate somehow. Well, he can't escalate apart from firing nuclear weapons. He's he's on the edge of of whatever he can do at the moment. Um, it, you know, but but but. Then you've got to ask yourself, well, why would he bother going nuclear when, for him, he probably thinks he's winning already? Um, if you look at the political bit, there's reluctance on the part of Schultz, uh, there's reluctance on the part of Biden to, do in, to, 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 to go further. And then he's got uh, Hungary on his side, Slovakia possibly on his side, Austria on his side. Switzerland being uh, difficult. He's still getting weapons from Iran. He's still getting weapons from North Korea. He's still getting parts uh, and and support from China. Why would he think he's losing? Thinking that, I'm I'm absolutely sure he he is absolutely. Um, I mean. He believes that he's already winning, and actually, at some point, he is because 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 of the fear of the West, because of the fear of escalation, which is yeah. ab absolutely uh, stupid. Pardon my French to me, because you can't really, you know, the the, the this talks of about escalation sound to me like how many Ukrainian civilians and children should die today, so we not call it an escalation, like some sort of a steady number, steady figure, that is okay and not an escalation yet. That's what it is. But trying to appease a monster, you're only, you know, trying to, uh, you're welcoming it, you know, open the door for it. But never mind, it, lift it or not, Ukraine will use its own weapons. It will happen at the moment, like new yes. Palyanita, like missile drones or new UAVs that you just mentioned that reach like Khabarovsk, that is 3,000 kilometers away from Kiev, and more and more Russian military depots will burn. And the moment will inevitably come when the Kremlin will find debris of Western attackums in Ukrainian missiles and drones, like saying that Ukrainians are already using and abusing Western weapons and blah, blah, blah. It will be lies, of course, as Russia is a mill of lies and produces nothing else. So what holds Biden's administration from acting is as genuine fear of escalation, indeed, do you think this is the case? Or another fear, political, caused by upcoming elections, maybe? That elections are always a, a part. Uh, I still have deep suspicions <laughs> myself uh, mm -hmm. about whether right. someone in the White House has been bought. Um, and I'm not afraid to say so, um, because they act as if they have. <laughs> right. uh, they, don't act, they don't act as if they are on our side many times. I mean, give enough but not giving enough. Um, and, and, you know, that, that, that there's no sense in that. There's no sense in prolonging this war and to even create the, situ the possible situation that Ukraine could collapse. There is no sense in that because, you know, that the moment that if that happened, 
um, then, you know, Poland is suddenly a frontline state. Romania is very clearly a frontline state. Yes. Uh, and you can then say uh, Bulgaria is a frontline state. So you've got this huge chunk of NATO added to the already uh, to, to the northern region. Um, and who wants that? But but sometimes I wonder, I wonder whether the White House even thinks uh, strategically at that level um, uh, or, or whether they just think it, you know, we give them enough and they can carry on. But there's risk in that. There is risk, always risk, uh, if you if you don't take war seriously. When you go to war, you've got to take war seriously. No way. Well, and I'm, I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry to say it, but I'm going yes. to say it. And the Ukrainian government is still not taking war seriously. And and until they do, then it's really, really difficult sometimes to persuade the allies that they should also mm. take it seriously. Um, because we there are still hundreds of things that the government could do that they're not doing. Um, like, and, you know, reforms, sorting out personnel better, sorting out money better. I mean, where does the money from the councils go? The towns, the, the towns. Oh, they can give money back to the army. Do you know where it goes? Is it's it? not clear. Right. Is that a question to me? Because I can... Um, yeah, that's a question to you. Right. Do I, I mean, you're a taxpayer. It's your money. Right. Well, you know, the, the, these questions are constantly asked by journalists and we have answers, but maybe we just cannot deliver these answers in a proper way to to uh, our Western audience. And certainly the um, state of Ukraine, Ukrainian state, can be managed better and administrated better. And the the power that is now has not only the questions of war to resolve, to quote, so, but... This is the topic of, of another discussion for, you know, for yeah. or an hour, uh, two week. hours, definitely. <laughs> I would love to do that, actually. That might be the, the topic of the, our next meeting here in the studio. But for now, can you please at least try to uh, shed some light on the question? Like Kursk, a thousand square kilometers captured in Russia. Incursion is onwards right now as we speak. So yet... Russia pushes in Pokrovsk and Volodya and like other places and communities and not even trying so much to free their own land. Why? Oh, that's quite a complex one militarily and politically. I mean, let's take the political bit. Uh, yes, please. It doesn't matter for Russia. That's the first bit. It doesn't matter. In fact, it may actually be to their advantage politically to be able to say, you know, we're being we're we're having a difficult time with these uh with these ukrainians more of you need to volunteer um because it, it actually in a way shows that ukraine is is you know even nastier than we thought um so that's the political side the, the military side it, well it was a surprise to them because they they underestimated the, the the ability of the of of ukraine and they certainly underestimated the ability of the leading brigades who actually did a, a did a brilliant job and are still Doing a brilliant job. Oh yes, um, and and they're fi they're fighting awesomely. There's no question about it. Um, and 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 it what it does do is it shows that when you release the 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 the, uh, the Ukrainian brigades to actually to fight yeah. as they can fight, yeah. you get a completely different answer to what you get when you hold them in a straight line and and you demand that all they do is stand there and die. Um, so you know. The Kursk is how we should be fighting everywhere. I love Mr. Grant, and we say we. I just love it. You don't say Ukraine, West. You say we. You're way more decisive than some people in in in, in White House and other houses of color around the globe. Thank you so very much for your time. I would love to uh, jump into a question of how Ukraine can manage uh, the state better next time with you. But this time, thank you so Please. very much. Yeah, for your time and expertise. And, uh, and, and glory to Ukraine. Heroim Slava. Diakou. Thank you so very much, sir. Okay. Bye bye. Goodbye. That was it for this episode. Thank you so very much for your precious time. It was me, Henry Keane, and your of English. We did our best to deliver you the hard truth in easy terms. You in turn, please don't be shy. Like, subscribe and comment. Your voice matters as it helps Ukrainian voice to be heard worldwide. Please stay safe and tune for more. Glory to Ukraine, as Glenn Grant said, and everyone who stands for it. Goodbye.